Would you please pray with me? Lord, would the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to begin this morning with a brief NFL update for you. It's the bye week for the Chicago Bears, and so it's time to reflect back and see what my team has been doing. They're four and two at this point in the season. The defense is dominant. The offense, led by a rookie QB, is ascendant, quickly catching up with the defense. The arrow is pointed up. The defense is especially impressive. Get a load of this. They are the very best in the NFL in tackling. Only a 5.8% missed tackle rate. They have also forced seven fumbles so far this season and recovered six of them. Most of these fumbles are because someone delivered a withering peanut punch named after former Bear Peanut Tillman, who was a master of this, popping the ball out of the offensive player's hands. And most of the recoveries are because the Bears are coached and practice swarming to the ball. And finally, their pass rush win rate of 54% is second in the league, meaning after the ball is hiked and the opposing QB drops back to pass, bear pass rushers beat the opposing offensive lineman more effectively than just about anyone else in the NFL, and so on. I'm obviously very proud of my team. Now, why am I beginning a sermon on catechesis with this? There's two reasons. First of all, just as a courtesy for those who have maybe grown weary with the hometown offering and are looking for a new America's team, just saying. Secondly, and more importantly, is this. The stats I just gave you are not wins and losses or even yards and scoring. They are the basics of good, solid defensive football. Tackling. Creating turnovers, hustling, pass rushing. And from them, all the other good things like yards and scoring flow. You have to go back 12 games to find a team who scored more than 17 points against this bare defense. So the results are there, but it's a result that is a direct result of them mastering the basics. How did they get there? It's an organizational commitment, especially of their head coach. For when Bears head coach Matt Eberflus was hired, he brought with him his so-called HITS principle. HITS is an acronym for hustle, intensity, turnovers, and playing smart football. It stresses four basic things that, to his mind, correlate with a culture of winning football. So he's coached the basics, and they have practiced the basics relentlessly, and the results are starting to show up. This is a fact that elite performers in every field actually know. In sport, in arts, music, uh, even the surgeon I had a few years ago told me, thankfully after my surgery, not before, <laughs> that he literally practiced every little scalpel stroke over and over and over again, even though he had done it a million times before until he had it just perfectly before the surgery. You see, anything that requires elite performance requires daily practice to maintain mastery of the basics. Everything builds off of that. It's merely an application of the basics applied in more complex or more competitive con contexts. Mastering the basics and passing that on to others. That's what catechesis is all about. So there's the connection with my bears. You see, we master the basics of what it means to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, and then we faithfully pass it on to others if we are a church where catechesis takes deep root. The church with a culture of catechesis will be a place filled with faithful disciples who themselves make disciples of Jesus, and so on and so on. Let's take a quick look again at our mission statement 
if we can have that up there. Last week, we focused on the first table, our vertical relationship as we pursue communion with God. This week, we begin our focus on the so-called second table, fellowship within the church. It's that horizontal relationship within the body of Christ marked by two key aspects. And if you could show my my little pyramid, there we go. Uh, Catechesis and fellowship as such. So this morning, I want to explore three key questions about that first moment, catechesis. First, when looking at our pyramid, why are those two aspects? Why do fellowship and catechesis belong together and define healthy relationships within the body of Christ? So this is the question of the purpose and necessity of catechesis. Second, what is taught in catechesis? Here I want to explore the content of catechesis. There is a historic practice that we Anglicans today are trying to revitalize. I think it's exciting stuff and exciting times because we're actually living in a time where we need to renew the catechumenate. Finally, how shall we create and maintain a culture of catechesis here at Church of the Resurrection? So we conclude then with a question of how to or a look forward at what might be coming. First, why fellowship and catechesis as the basis of our community? Well, basically, it's a biblical model. (laughs) In the Old Testament, the vision for the kind of fellowship the children of Israel were to enjoy with God and with one another was defined by a confession. We find it in our Old Testament reading this morning from Deuteronomy 6. It begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, what is called the Shema, the brief identity statement of faithful Jews as followers of the one true God. And it goes on, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might, which Jesus himself eventually states is the first essential part of the law and the prophets. The other part, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, can easily be distilled out of that great distillation of the law, otherwise known as the Ten Commandments. In other words, the children of Israel are commended certain basics. No matter how complex some of the various regulations or ceremonial laws were, the basics is what the Lord himself stresses here as the children are coming into the land taking the land and settling it. And the vision was to hand them down faithfully from one generation to the next. Look at how the faithful Jew is to do it. You shall teach them diligently these commands of the Lord to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. They should even wear the law on their hands and foreheads and write it on the doorposts and gates of their home. So pervasive is to be this teaching, this handing on of the basics from one generation to the next. And it all begins at home. It's comprehensive, woven into all that a faithful family does. The vision is community is united by a common confession. It's a confessional community, defined by the basics, taught faithfully or catechized from one generation to the next. And you know, when we get to the New Testament, there's really no difference. Jesus' parting words to his disciples in the Great Commission is to go make disciples, and he stresses two defining features of what that is, namely, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. A disciple is baptized, meaning they have been brought to a life-surrendering commitment to Jesus, but through what? Through teaching them all that Jesus taught. How do you know what being a disciple is? How do you know what this surrender of baptism is? You teach them all that Jesus commanded. So again, we find community defined by a common confession passed on faithfully from one generation to the next. 
That's catechesis. In a sense, the rest of the New Testament can be read as a commentary on how the apostolic church went about doing both of these things, baptizing and catechizing. So not surprisingly, when you come to our epistle reading for today from Ephesians 4, you find Paul also embracing this vision. A few verses before what we read this morning, Paul beautifully describes what true biblical fellowship in the church is all about. Let me briefly read you these words from the first part of Ephesians 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Ah, that's amazing, isn't it? Paul is outlining here, I believe, the two key elements to healthy fellowship within the body of Christ. First is found in verses 1 through 3 where true fellowship is a place where we bear with one another in love, with humility, gentleness, patience, eager to maintain the unity of the body in the bond of peace. So we love one another, care for one another, assisting those in need, support, encourage, and pray for one another. We'll look more at those aspects of fellowship in greater depth next week. But catechesis, I think, is really the core element of the second part there of verses 4 through 6. Because if we say there is one Lord, one faith, one hope, one baptism, what is that one to which we are called? You see, catechesis passes on those ones. Who is that one Lord? What is that one faith and hope? How do we live out one baptism through which we are united with Christ in his death and resurrection, so that we maintain the unity of the fellowship, one table. These are the kinds of questions we address in catechesis. You see, the mastery of the basics always keeps us grounded in the truth. When we pass the basics on effectively to others, we remain grounded one generation after the next, as we find in Jude 3, calling it the faith once delivered to the saints, and now passed on to you and to me. Without catechesis, our fellowship will simply be emptying. It will be the unity of a mere social club, or maybe a good dinner gathering. Not that richer reality that Paul describes there. That bond of one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Sadly, we've seen believers and churches in our day, revise basic teachings of Scripture and continue to call themselves Christian. Sadly, I'm afraid our surrounding culture today is doing a better job catechizing people than we are. For Paul prophesies against just such a situation in our epistle reading this morning, when you turn to our actual verses, because he speaks of churches being tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, he pleads for faithful catechesis where we will speak the truth in love and grow up in every way into him who is the head into Jesus Christ. In other words, in the body of Christ, Christ gets to say what it means to be a disciple. We don't. He defines our one faith once delivered to the saints, not us. And his teaching is still just as powerful today as ever. We don't have to be ashamed of the basics. For they do contain the way, the truth, and the life for each and every age, even our own, which in many ways just seems to think we know better. 
We don't. And it's up to us, the church, to faithfully pass on these teachings, to plant that seed of faith, if you will, according to Jesus' parable, and to continually cultivate the good, fertile soil in which it might take deep roots in our hearts and lives, in our homes, in our churches. We want a hundredfold, right? Or even 60 or 30 would be pretty good. 30x is not bad if you're an investor, right? But friends, that's the stakes today in our generation, in our land. They're exceedingly high. And if we don't cultivate that soil, and if we don't plant deep roots of catechesis in our lives and in our church. Let me just put it briefly in terms of our core values. A rooted and restful and relational church is one who is rooted in one faith and one baptism, resting in the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ alone and is one body in faithful relationship to one another in love. And I hope you can see just how vital catechesis is if we are to be just such a church. Second, what then is the content of catechesis? What what are these basics? So far, all I've said is that catechesis is mastering the basics and passing on that mastery to others. Well, what are they? Well, as the church's missionary efforts progressed in the first, second, third century, and churches eventually took root throughout the Mediterranean world, there was a clear need to catechize those coming out of a pagan way of life into the life of the church. And then eventually, as Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, around 300 or so, more and more people were already being raised up in the faith, but then the catechetical need became a little different. There were not only those still coming out of paganism, yes, but it was now to make sure those who had already been baptized were faithfully being raised up in the gospel, that they would really know what it was. One of the most powerful visions for catechesis in this time frame was St. Augustine. In the 4th and 5th centuries and in various works, and especially his own practice as a bishop, he modeled faithful catechesis. Two key things stand out about Augustine's approach. The first key thing, he wanted catechists to keep it simple. <laughs> he kept it simple in two ways. First and foremost, I love this, Augustine said, keep it simple by telling a story. Tell the story. Tell the story of God's great savings deeds and tell your own story of your place in it. You see, stories capture our imagination and allow us to enter into the drama ourselves. You know, we implicitly catechize each week in our liturgy where we retell the story of God's creation, our fall into sin and death, and our redemption in Christ Jesus. We then triumphantly proclaim our great hope with the simple story, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. You see, liturgy is itself catechetical. It powerfully forms and shapes us, often in ways undetected. But there are more explicit moments of catechesis in our life as a church and in our worship too. One reason why I love so much the great Easter vigil is that through a series of scripture readings and collects, the vigil retells the great story of God's saving deeds as we wait expectantly for his greatest deed of all in the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter morn. This is more explicit catechesis than implicit and it follows, though, Augustine's storytelling approach. Our church will, in 2025, hold an Easter vigil as well, as a part of an unfolding catechetical vision for our church and, yes, the enrichment of our worship life. Now, Augustine also kept it simple by drawing upon the Apostles' Creed as a simple statement of Christian doctrine, which candidates for baptism were required to memorize and understand, and the Lord's Prayer as a simple statement of the Christian spiritual life. 
Augustine expounded on the Apostles' Creed as the essence of faith. The Lord's Prayer was the essence of hope. And the sacraments were the essence of love. So faith, hope, and love, the three cardinal virtues, formed the simple structure of the Christian life according to Augustine, the Catechist. Eventually, by the 8th century, Ten Commandments were added to the Creed and the Lord's Prayer as the key content of catechesis. To this day, the great catechisms of the church mirror this structure. The Anglican Catechism, here's a copy of it, called To Be a Christian, follows the same pattern. First is believing in, uh, is believing in Christ is focused on the Apostles' Creed, that first part. Then belonging to Christ is focused on the Lord's Prayer, and finally, becoming like Christ is focused on the Ten Commandments as containing that core of what it means to love God and love neighbor. But Augustine's second key emphasis as a catechist might be the most important and maybe the most neglected. As bishop, he taught his catechists pay special heed to the heart's of catechists, and of the catechumen. Make sure there is much joy in the journey and a heart-to-heart connection between teacher and learner. This is a quote from him in his little manual on how to go about catechizing. If then we ourselves are burning with the flame of holy charity, we shall certainly be effective in kindling it in others. As any good teacher knows, we teach ourselves as much or more than we teach our subject. (laughs) So we better make sure that subject and self are deeply aligned, intertwined. You see, we can have all the catechetical content, but without connection, it will fall flat. It won't accomplish the key purpose of catechesis. That is a transformed life, right? Where we're not just merely hearers of that word, but where, as Jesus says, it's taken deep, transformative root in our lives. Yes, we need faithful content. The church must faithfully teach what's, what is true, what is the way, the truth, and the life. But if people don't trust you, how are they going to trust God? if they don't feel the hope of the gospel in and through you and our church, and we're not transparent about that hope in amidst life's great struggles, how will they ever hope in the Lord? People won't love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and their neighbor as themselves, if they themselves do not regularly feel the love of God from us. You see, Augustine is so right about the content. Keep it simple, stupid. (laughs) But he's even more right about the heart-to-heart, life-on-life connection that is the only proper context for transformative catechesis. That connection piece is, I suspect, where our culture is today maybe doing a better job with our youth than the church is. And let's be honest, parents and teachers, it is never easy to connect with our children. There is a great age and life experience gap which we must always bridge with someone who is 10, 20, 30 years or more younger than us. I don't know what happens, but I keep getting older and older and they always stay the same age. It's perplexing and confounding. But I believe it's more challenging than ever as the devices in our pockets, the streaming video and information channels open 24-7, 365, vie for everyone's attention. Not just our kids, but ours, our own as well. It's harder than ever to connect and connect meaningfully one with another. And that's not just between adults and children, but amongst adults as well. So this leads us inexorably to our final point today. Three, how then do we catechize best? Let me point out three things here. First, let me point out that our mission statement is powerfully prophetic, countercultural, 
in our current moment. Our church's mission statement stresses that relational element. We must prioritize that relational context and work in our church. We have things going already on that I think are vital parts of this. Our Mesa group ministry, for one, of, for one thing. It's a place where, as we'll see, and we'll talk more about this next week, where we can share life together. But can we, out of those kinds of life-on-life engagements, concern that arises among our, in the body, can we find one another ways to engage more catechetically as well? To use our time together to deepen our commitment to the way, the truth, and the life. Can we find ways to engage one another where catechesis is not merely the dispensing of content, but where our true heart and purpose is the formation of Christians one with another? That's why I love that today we have actually a parents gathering after this service. Um, We didn't plan it this way, but it lines up perfectly that we're going to have a parents gathering to talk about the habits of a faithful household, the way that catechesis at home might actually become more a part of the warp and woof of our lives. And I love that this was a parent's idea. Thank you, Kelly Cummins, wherever you might be. And not just a program developed by our clergy or staff. You see, it's crucial to our becoming that kind of community where we parents faithfully pass on the faith to our children, that we parents roll up our sleeves get concerned, and become chief catechists in our own homes. That's one way that we have to do it. Secondly, we are already doing some catechesis. Can we do it more? So right now, our children are out. They are learning the Word of God. Um, We do have some folks who are engaged in things like Bible studies one with another. I've caught wind of perhaps uh, a renewed effort in that regard amongst the church's women. We are doing some things. Can we do more? How can we enhance that? And you see, it's not just a matter about doing more, again, providing more content. I think it's more about creating this culture of catechesis where we take seriously that there is this one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and we're dying to make sure that everyone understands it and grows in the depth of our knowledge and love. So the call here is really love what we've got, love it well enough that we can roll up our sleeves together and get better at it. And then here's the final thing I want to point out. I've talked a lot about catechesis being that one generation to the next. And we tend to think about that as an adult passing it on to children. But you know what? If you're going to be excellent, you never outgrow catechesis. You never outgrow it. Adults need it as well. In fact, when you think about it, the Christian faith is a pretty basic thing, isn't it? Not very complicated. Right? That's why in that ancient world, it caught fire amongst who? The poor, the outcast, the uneducated, because the gospel is simply powerful, basic stuff. But we adults, we can't ever tire of that basic gospel message just burning in our own heart. And part of the way we do that is we ourselves have got to get better at exploring and remaining ourselves in the catechumenate. The vision right now of the Committee for Catechesis of the Anglican Church is that we would revitalize the catechumenate and it would become something from cradle to grave. That's a life experience. And we adults need it too. So here's a little thing to stick a pin in. In the coming weeks and months, as we grow in relationship with each other, and I get to know you more as your rector, and you know me, we're going to figure this out. Because we adults need 
catechesis too. And it's not just for the kids. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.